the last few minutes. We got about ten minutes left. How they use these scapegoat uh, scapegoats to protect themselves? Well, the list of all the top American Masonic Jewish Zionists or Masonic Jewish labor Zionists, because there's six different Zionists, and I define this on a broadcast with Lenny Bloom. That these Zionists, uh, labor Zionists, oh, many, most of them are members of the California Foreign Relations. Mm-hmm. You got uh, Thomas Friedman, who wrote The World is Flat. And what's he doing? He's destroying the national sovereignty of America, outsourcing our, our, our jobs to India and other places because, ah, the world is flat. You have a, a, a host of others that are members of the Council of Foreign Relations. Just get the annual report of the CFR for 2006, and you'll see all their names. It's in excess of probably four or 500 of the Masonic Jewish Zionists there. They're all serving the papacy. They're manning banks. They're manning positions of power in the Department of Justice and other places. They're all placed, and their loyalty is with the Archbishop of New York through their membership in the California Foreign Relations. And it's this very California Foreign Relations. Uh, Perez comes and visits and gets his marching orders, uh, et cetera, et cetera, from the Knights of Malta who run the California Foreign Relations there in New York City. So that's how it works. You always have the Pope's court Jews subordinate to the Gentile leaders of every nation. And then they're easy to blame. They're right out there in front, right? And they consent to be blamed, like Larry Silverstein. Right. Which, which you know he consented to be blamed when he purchased the World Trade Center so that he could get how many billions in an insurance policy so that everyone can say, look who benefited. Yeah. The Jews. Mm-hmm. He willingly consented to this. Why? Because these Masonic Jewish labor Zionists working for the Vatican want to either kill every Jew in North America, like Bernard Baruch was one of them, or, or the ones that would survive to drive them back to the killing floor in the Middle East called Israel, because it's the Pope's intention to attempt to drive as many Jews there as possible so that ultimately he can kill them all and never be bothered with any Jew ever again because they have the Abrahamic promise, but the Pope will be surprised because at that, about that time when he's about successfully able to do it as the Antichrist, the Messiah of the lowly will regicide justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order for regicide. Justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order. The Protestant Reformation was grounded on two pillars. The one was the centrality of Christ and his word, and the other one was opposition to the Antichrist, who they felt robbed Christ of his glory and replaced him with a system and with saints and holy people and priests and legates. So the Protestant Reformation put Christ back into the center, put his word as the authority, and it identified the Antichrist, which they said was Rome. And they had very sound arguments based on the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 7. And it's interesting that Martin Luther at first thought that the book of Revelation was bogus. It didn't make any sense to him. And then they discovered the prophecies in the book of Daniel. And when Martin Luther translated the Old Testament, the very first book he translated was the book of Daniel. 
Why would he do that? Why didn't he start with Genesis? Well, he used the book of Daniel because he said, we need this book for the miserable times we leave, live in, and this is the key. And then, when they brought out his big Bible, there were numerous um, illustrations in this big Bible, and guess what? 90% of those illustrations came from the book of Revelation. So he must have had a change of heart, right? Why? Because he had discovered the key. And the key was the book of Daniel. And so prophecy became the hallmark of the Protestant movement whereby they defended themselves. When John Knox came back out of his exile and confronted Queen Mary of Scotland. And he came to Scotland from Geneva. The very first sermon he preached was Daniel chapter 7. And guess what? The whole of Scotland became Protestant. Wow! Oops, sorry. I do say that a lot, don't I? <laughs> the whole of Scotland became Protestant. The grand old protest, they called it. And they rediscovered the centrality of Christ. They rediscovered prof prophecy. They rediscovered the word as the basis for what they believed. And uh, they had formidable enemies. The Jesuits. And the Jesuits were founded with the express purpose of destroying Protestantism. That's what they were there for. That was their sole object in life. To unite the world and to bring it back to the papacy. So the Jesuits swear an oath perinde e cadaver, to be like a corpse when it comes to obedience. And even if God should give them a dog as a general, father general, they would obey him without question. And if he said black was white when it was actually black, then it was white. That's the nature of Jesuitism. And I'm not going to go into their oaths, you should know all these things, how they swore to obliterate, by whatever means possible, Protestantism from the face of the earth. And of course, they also had formidable intellectuals opposing the Protestant Reformation. And they would argue that the little horn could not possibly be the papacy because it ruled for only three and a half years. And then the Lutheran theologians took on the Jesuits and said, how ridiculous is this theology of the Jesuits? Because nobody can doubt that we are talking of day for a year principles. And that was the Protestant Reformation. Now, not only that, Martin Luther and Melanchthon in particular knew that they had changed the law. But they had so many crises, they never actually quite got back to it. And the devil was clever too. Martin Luther had quite a confrontation with the Anabaptists, and the Anabaptists were Sabbath keepers. But whenever there is truth, the devil is also very busy, and so they were rather fanatical, whooping and shouting and screaming and rolling, and this was offensive. And so the movement never embraced the Sabbath. But Melanchthon said that the papacy had changed God's law as can be seen in the transference of 
the Sabbath to the Sunday. He thinks he can change God's law. So they recognized all of those features. And Martin Luther said, I doesn't know how it could have been even imputed.